In this video, we will measure the time reversibility of financial time series using Bitcoin price as an example. Time reversibility as a concept has applications in physics and various areas of math, but here we'll focus on time irreversibility as a feature or indicator for financial time series. Broadly speaking, a time series is reversible if its statistical properties are the same when it's reversed. Time irreversibility can manifest in many different ways, and there have been several different methods devised to measure it. In this video, we'll look at two of them. But first, let's look at a reversible and irreversible series. This is a sine wave. Sine waves are reversible. In a moment, we'll go over an irreversibility measure called the relative asynchronous index. For now, just know this measure ranges from 0 to 1, 0 meaning the input series is reversible. On this sine wave, the relative asynchronous index measures 0.003, indicating the series is reversible. Here's another series generated from a logistic map. The logistic map is built from this recurrence relation. It's often used as a simple example of chaotic behavior arising from nonlinear dynamic equations. With this series, the relative asynchronous index measures 0.15. Using irreversibility measures with a rolling window on market prices, we can find times where the price is showing signs of nonlinear dynamics or chaotic behavior. Perhaps certain trading strategies will perform better or worse during these times. Let's now go over the relative asynchronous index. This measure makes use of the horizontal visibility graph. I covered visibility graphs and the adjacency matrix in my previous video, so I will assume you are already familiar. Here is an example series and its horizontal visibility graphs adjacency matrix. The first step is counting the number of outgoing links on each node. An outgoing link from a node is a link to a node at a future time. For example, node 2 has 4 total links, but only 3 of them are outgoing, because there are 3 links to a node at a future time. Node 5, the last node, has 0 outgoing links because there are no nodes in the future for it to link to. Counting the outgoing links is straightforward with the adjacency matrix. For each row, we sum the values that are to the right of the diagonal. Node 0 has one outgoing link. Node 1 has one outgoing link. Node 2 has three outgoing links. And node 3 has one outgoing link, and so on. These are the outgoing link counts for this visibility graph. The next step is to reverse the series and do the same thing. Here is the visibility graph of the regular series and the reversed series side by side. We count the outgoing links in the exact same way using the reversed series visibility graph. This leaves us with two arrays of outgoing link counts, one for the forward series and one for the reverse series. With these two series, we compute the asynchronous index between them. The asynchronous index takes two arrays and returns a number. It is not necessarily symmetric, so the asynchronous index from A to B is not necessarily equal to the asynchronous index from B to A. This is not a hard rule as they can be equal, but often they are not. To compute the asynchronous index between two arrays, first we find the permutation that sorts the first array in ascending order. Here is that permutation. These are the indices of the sorted array. The lowest value in the array is on index 5, the second lowest is on index 0, and so on. The asynchronous index counts how many times the second array is decreasing where the first array is increasing. We use these sorted indices from the first array on the second array to get the count. Let's look at the code for the asynchronous index. We have this function that takes two arrays. The two arrays need to have the same length, so we have this assertion here. We find the permutation that sorts the first array. This normalization constant is the maximum amount of ways the two arrays could differ. We use it to normalize the final count. We keep track of the amount of times the two arrays have different orderings in this variable in version n. Then we move on to these nested loops, which will check each pair of values in the second array. Note that j will always be larger than i. We find the difference between each pair of values in the second array using the sorted indices from the first array. If the two arrays are synchronized, having the same order, the difference should always be zero or less. If they are out of sync, the difference will be greater than zero. In that case, we increase the counts. We divide the final count by the normalization constant and return. Now let's look at the code for the relative asynchronous index. This function takes in a single array or time series, we create two visibility graphs, one for the regular series and one for the reversed order series. We build them using the array and the reversed array. This numpy function flip reverses the order of the input. Then we get the adjacency matrix of both the visibility graphs. Now we count the number of outgoing links for both of the graphs. 
We create arrays to hold the number of outgoing links at each node. We loop through each row of the adjacency matrix, then get the sum of the links to the right of the diagonal. This row indexer will get the values from the diagonal to the end of the row. Now we have the number of outgoing links for the forward and reversed series. Then we compute the asynchronous index between the outgoing links in both directions from forward to reverse, and reverse to forward. The relative asynchronous index is the ratio between the minimum and maximum of these values, so the ratio will always be one or less. We take the logarithm of this ratio and flip the sign. This way, the final value will have a minimum possible value of zero and a maximum possible value of one. There's one more short function to go over for computing the relative asynchronous index in a rolling window. This function takes an array of closing prices or something else and a look back window. We create an output array for the indicator values, then we loop through each value in the array. We get the recent window of values as specified by the look back. We pass these recent values into the relative asynchronous index function and add the returned value to the array for the current index. Here is the relative asynchronous index on daily Bitcoin data with a rolling window of one year. Plotted in orange, this indicator tends to have a high amount of noise, so I added some smoothing to it. I used a seven period exponential moving average plotted in red. This plot isn't necessarily practical for building a trading system, but it gives us an idea where the price has historically been more irreversible. During the bubble of 2021, we saw much higher readings, and throughout 2022, we see much lower readings. The paper proposing the relative asynchronous index shows its behavior on a variety of stock indices during the 2008 financial crisis. The paper is worth looking at to see its behavior in that scenario as well. I found this indicator when calculated on hourly data to be effective for filtering mean reversion trades. Typically when reversibility is lower, some of my mean reversion systems tend to do better. In my experience, mean reversion strategies generally did better in 2022 than trend following strategies, and the lower values throughout 2022 align with this observation. Anyways, we'll look at more charts later, let's move on to another measure for irreversibility. This next measure is from this paper. The measure compares the distribution of permutation patterns, also known as ordinal patterns, from the forward series and reversed series. Conveniently, I have a video about ordinal patterns already. In that video, we compute permutation entropy of financial time series. This reversibility computation is quite similar. I'm going to assume you've watched the ordinal patterns video already. Just like in the permutation entropy video, we find the probability distribution of ordinal patterns for the series. Then we reverse the series and find the probability distribution of ordinal patterns for the reversed series. The reversibility measure is the callback Liebler divergence between the two distributions of ordinal patterns. Let's look at the code for this measure. We have this function which takes an array. The input needs to be fairly long for this calculation to be stable. I'd say at least 60, but preferably more. We get the reversed array using the NumPy's flip. We use the ordinal patterns function, which we went over in the ordinal patterns video to symbolize the series. I have it hard coded to use an embedding dimension of three. This is because any more than three would require a massive look back window. Because the used embedding dimension of three, the first two values in the returned array will be NAN, so we cut them off. I also convert the resulting array to integers. We do the same for the reversed array. We use the numpy function bin count to count the number of occurrences of each ordinal pattern. We divide these counts by the size of the input to get probabilities. Then we compute the relative entropy, also known as the callback Liebler divergence between the two distributions. The relative entropy computation will not work if there's a zero in either of the distributions, so we check for it. And if there is, we return NAN. This is why we need the input length to be fairly long. We need enough data so each pattern is represented. Here is the function to compute this measure with a rolling window. We take an input and a window size. We increase the look back by two. This is because the hard-coded embedding dimension of three needs the extra two pieces of data to be calculated. We loop through the array. We get the recent window of data. Then we pass that recent data to the reversibility function. Because this function can return NAN, we need to handle that in some way. So we check for a NAN value. If there is one, we just use the last value for reversibility. This shouldn't happen often, so if you notice large streaks of repeating values in the indicator, then a longer look back window is required. Here is daily Bitcoin data with the ordinal pattern reversibility measure in orange and the smoothed relative asynchronous index in red. Both have a look back of one year. 
The two measures have a fair amount of correlation, which isn't surprising as they are both attempting to measure the same thing, but they do differ at times. This ordinal pattern based measure seems to have a bit less noise than the relative asynchronous index when applied in a rolling window. There is no smoothing applied to the orange series. Here are the same indicators on the hourly time frame with a look back of 168 or one week. I found this indicator useful in a meta-labeling setup for a mean reversion system. These indicators will probably be most useful to those of you utilizing machine learning in your trading, as these reversibility measures are hard to interpret manually. To those of you who are utilizing machine learning, I imagine you have a large collection of features or indicators that you scan. As I'm sure you know, a common problem is that many market indicators tend to have a high correlation with each other. At least for me, these reversibility measures have almost zero correlation with the other features I typically look at. So these indicators might be a breath of fresh air for your feature collection. On the off chance you find these measures very potent for your particular strategies, you may want to check out this paper. It is a survey of different methods for measuring irreversibility of time series. The two methods I've shown in this video are certainly not the only two. Anyways, that's it for this one. Thank you for watching.